Everyone have a seat? Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us here after lunch and after that really exciting ribbon cutting from over there on the other side of the office. My name is Helena Krusak, and I am a program manager for AFWorks under the uh, Capital Initiatives team, where my job is leading efforts around our team's uh, attempts to connect the ecosystem, which is a big theme for today's events, as well as this particular panel. So really good timing and uh, a really great opportunity to be talking about um, how we are connecting the ecosystem. And I love to see also here on National Women's Day a panel full of women leaders in the defense space. So very excited to introduce this panel. Um, if I can pull up my notes, I will introduce our moder moderator, um, Colonel Tiana Enriquez is the installation commander for Hanscom Air Force Base in Massachusetts, and she has a really impressive bio, so let me get this out, and I apologize for reading from my notes. Uh, as the installation commander, Colonel Tiana Enriquez focuses on filling gaps and stimulating the innovation partnerships as the face of the Air Force in New England. In her position, she is uh, focused on supporting the people who live, work, and visit Hanscom Air Force Base, energy resiliency initiatives, improving the installation's technology for seamless connectivity, innovation and partnerships, and supporting the veterans community throughout Hanscom. Colonel Enrique's uh, previous roles include Director of Contracting, a mission support program, uh, Executive Officers for Nuclear Command and Control and Communications, Digital, Kessel Run, and Command and Control Communications Intelligence and Networks. You've been all over. Uh, yeah, you have participation in all aspects of the Air Force, so really great to have your uh, your visibility into this and your ability to participate in this conversation. So, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you. Does anyone need this? this one? Okay, awesome. Awesome, so it's, it's great to be here. Um, thank you for the introduction. I am so impressed to share the stage um, with all of these uh, professionals to my left who happen to be women. Um, in their own right, and they're going to go through and introduce themselves. Um, so the way the panel's going to work today is this is really, we're going to talk about the how. I think we've heard a lot going um, through each of the other panels. Okay, we'll go to this. Um, and we've talked about um, the why, right, and the need of where we need to be. Um, and this panel is about the how, and you're going to see that um, I, the ribbon cutting that we just saw was a, talking about joint. Joint is more than just a service. It's joint with academia, it's joint with industry, and it's joint with services. It takes all of us. Um, and four years ago, um, truth be told, I was at my first South by Southwest here. So 2020, it was right before COVID kicked off. And where we were then and where we are today, we weren't talking joint, I can tell you that. Um, and we weren't integrated the way that we are today. And so just to set the scene setter um, with what we're gonna talk about, I'm excited um, to share the stage with them and they're gonna introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Karen Rath. I'm the AFWorks Deputy Director. Um, so one of my major priorities is partnerships. Um, that's why I was hired, that was why I was brought on board. Um, I have a past working open innovation facilities where we were able to effectively bring industry, academia, government together in one space to be able to talk back and forth of what that means. And a lot of that involved being able to talk in our own common languages, being able to cross that barrier and understand what genuinely motivated, being able for the government to be able to talk about profit and loss statements and how that we would impact other organizations' profit and loss and bring that to bear. Um, I was previously the chief engineer of a tech director in the Air Force Research Laboratory. I'm a software and systems engineer by trade, so I love to talk about things that relate back to the software industry, like there is no silver bullet. There is no soft silver bullet in innovation either. Without bringing all of us together and our own special unique superpowers, that's how we're going to have the impact we're looking for. And I'm excited that we're having this talk while here in the Avengers <laughs> theme space. <laughs> Um, because we know, I think, I think we saw a movie about how if there's Iron Man and only Iron Man and all the services, that's probably a bad idea. And so that's where, when we genuinely bring the, everyone together as a team, we can have that impact at the Avengers level. Everyone bringing their unique superpowers to bear on that. So. All right, we're just going to pass this mic. Exactly. So my name is Dr. Casey Purley. I'm the director of Army Applications Lab, which is just that way if you walk out the door. Um, I came to AAL five years ago, uh, fresh out of doing my postdoc work at the Army's Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases. Uh, I studied hemorrhagic fever viruses, wore the big suit, did all the hot zone stuff. 
From the Army's perspective, we are the service that has the smallest R&D budget. So we really need to partner with other services to leverage what they're working on if we have any chance of getting everything that we want on our priority list. So I'm so excited to be up here with the partners that we work with on a daily basis. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Aditi Kumar. I am uh, the Deputy Director for Policy Strategy and National Security Partnerships at DIU. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here today and a pleasure to open our new space here with AppWorks and Naval X. Uh, which is really intended to be a front door to, to this community of innovators, and we couldn't be happier to have a touch point um, closer to you. Um, I come to DIU by way of ANS within the department, so I have an acquisition background. Um, and for the past, uh, you know, unfortunately, two years, I've been, uh, while I was in ANS, was working the Ukraine problem set and. Uh, Realizing, uh, just like a lot of folks in the department did, the, the challenges in our industrial base, the challenges of production, um, the challenges of, of producing exquisite systems that just take years to produce, even when everything works like clockwork. Because we're not working like clockwork. Um, and so I came to DIU with a very specific um, idea and mission, which was to try to expand um, the industrial base and to try to focus on technologies and capabilities that we in the department can procure faster, that our innovation base can develop faster, um, so that we can stay ahead of the warfighter needs. So that's what really brought me here. And it was a, a, a great time for me to join DIU because my arrival coincided with um, our DIU 3.0 strategy under the leadership of Doug Beck, which is focused on exactly those things. It is moving with focus on the right problem sets. It's moving uh, to achieve scale um, and at speed. So uh, that's that's what we are really all about and really looking forward to the conversation today. My mic is tired after a long day, so uh, I'm going to the handout. So my name is Lieutenant Colonel Jed Warren. I'm the military deputy at AFWORK, so a wonder twin to Karen if she'll have me. So um, my role at AFWORKS currently, um, I've, I, am in, I am one of the few um, folks from the front office who's in the national capital region. So um, AFWORKS is really unique in that even our military are full our telework, right? We're a hybrid organization, but we primarily all work from home and um, come in to work based on events that are needed. So with my role, um, I, with Colonel Lee at Dayton and Ms. Roth out in Rome, New York, um, I give a lot of the briefings and do a lot of the advocacy for AFWORKS um, and across the ecosystem for whoever needs like an in-person person that gets to be me. Um, also, um, this is my third assignment as an active duty member that's been telework. And so, and primarily telework or full-time telework. And so I'm a huge remote work advocate and working on how we continue to upskill how we work remotely and try to give more opportunities across the military for others to potentially consider hybrid and uh, more telework than we do right now. And so as I'm the deputy right now, but at the end of the month, I'll transition to the SPARC division chief to backfill uh, Colonel Salinas, who you saw in some previous panels. Yes, all of the uh, your mics are apparently tired and done for the day. Um, but you're still here, so you're not. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I am Cassie Muckley. I am the program director for the Defense Innovation On-Ramp Hubs. That is a program within the National Security Innovation Network. We are a program office nested inside of DIU, so I get to work with great people like Haditi. Um, this role and this organization is really kind of about coming full circle for me. So as you might imagine, National Security Innovation Network, it's all about building a network and we utilize programs to build that network, attracting new talent, new um, technologies in. Um, I had no interest in working in defense whatsoever. I'm like, I'm gonna grow up, I'm gonna be an engineer. But then somehow somebody, I found out about a summer hire internship at the Air Force Base there in Montana. Um, and I have been a civil servant for almost 20 years now. <laughs> so the idea that now I'm getting to help bring in and attract that new talent and that new workforce and show people that it's more, no matter what your interest is, there's a place for you within the DOD and we need you. 
So we have a series of questions here as we are going to leave, uh, leave time for Q&A. So please get those ready. So um, first question is, how do you and your current role connect with you and your ecosystem? So I think that this is a perfect opportunity to talk about uh, the meetings that Aditi just referred to of the defense innovation uh, community that we're building here together. And so as the deputy director, that's one of my predominant roles is to participate in that community, to reach out to AAL, to reach out to DIU, to reach out to Naval X, and make sure that we're, we're coming together and that we're able to share data, that we're able to share strategies um, that we're able to lean forward into our unique focus areas while knowing that then we can pass off opportunities as they arise to our service partners and have the next best person in order to catch that. Um, I've talked back and forth with Casey several times of like, she's like, you have the entire Cyber Center portfolio and the entirety of the Air Force, that power. I'm like, but look at the really cool business cases that you're able to really customize and work and design business opportunities around through everything. Like, so I'm sitting there, we're sitting there drooling over the other superpowers that each other has, but that's where it's been really cool that especially working here in Capital Factory of being able to kind of pass the ball between our different organizations and say like, I know you have this, I don't have this today, you've got this, here's this ball. And there's so many technology enablers that are common across all of our services that where we can really do that. And when we see something that's getting it available, hey, you need this for your robot over here, now go. Um, and so that really is where my predominant role is, is building those partnerships and make sure that we have all of our boundaries really well defined. Um, so the systems engineer in me comes out, I wanna put everything in their little boxes and make them out, I can't help myself. Um, and so that way we know when it's time we're exiting our interface and going into the next boss and pass it on. So that way we're all very clear to do that quickly, easily, and um, for the best for service for all the companies that we work with. So I'll just say also at a granular level, there are four companies off the top of my head that AFWorks and us have either co-invested in or passed back and forth. And by that I mean there's one, and I'm really frustrated about it, the Army was not the right home, or the Army wasn't ready to take the technology, but the Air Force had it. <laughs> so not only did the Air Force then get the benefit of us having bought down quite a lot of risk on the technology, from our perspective, now they're keeping that team together, they're keeping it developing, so one day, because there will be a day, when the Army is ready to bring it back in, it hasn't been mothballed at the company, it hasn't stagnated, that company hasn't reassigned all the engineers. There's a value in us being able to call each other, which we do, but there's also a value in us being right across the hall and just being able to walk over and have those conversations um, face to face. So it's, we're so excited that y'all are here in that space across the hall. Uh, we are too. So I would say that DIU is primarily connecting the ecosystem in two ways. The one is uh, what uh, uh, Karen and Casey were referencing, which is connecting the innovation organizations across the department. And we actually just had a really productive uh, discussion, uh, half brainstorm, mostly brainstorm, uh, but, but uh, a series of really good ideas of things that we can achieve in the next three months, things we can achieve in the next six months. And the types of things we were talking about were, number one, how do you better connect the quote unquote innovation awards two sources of DOD demand. How do we make sure that everybody understands those? And going back to the warfighter-centric uh, uh, concept that is so central to DIU's own strategy, how do we make sure that all of the innovation community understands the combat command's needs? And that's what we're all working towards in our various portfolio using our various superpowers to your phrase. Um, the second part of the discussion was about uh, how do we better engage with the commercial tech sector, many of you. What are the, the pain points that we know you face some of which may have to do with interacting with all of us piecemeal, and how do we fix that so that when you talk to one of us, you know you're talking to all of us, uh, and that we will get you to the right place for your, um, your particular capability area. Um, and then there were a whole host of other things related to you know, digital tools and talent management, things like that, but you know, we really saw the power of, of um, uh, our collective uh, scale in tackling those problems, because really we're all facing the same issues, and, I think DIU can play a catalyzing role in that and bring those back up to the secretary um, to solve, which is uh, something that he's really focused on. 
Um, the other way in which we're um, connecting the innovation ecosystem is uh, with uh, allies and partners. Um, so thinking about um, the challenges that we're facing here, they're actually not that different uh, when whether you're thinking about AUKUS or whether you're thinking about the India partnership. Um, and again, there are multiple ways in which we're doing this. In some cases, we're hel uh, helping ministries of defense set up their versions of DIUs and AFWORKS and AALs, et cetera. Um, and we are giving our best practices and lessons learned to help them think through what authorities they might need from their uh, respective legislatures, um, what tools we have found relevant. Um, in some cases, we're doing joint challenges with them where we will put out a problem statement that both of our ministries um, are interested in solving and we will uh, open that up to communities of startups in both countries and be involved in each other's processes, try to create on-ramps um, as DIU regularly tries to do for uh, a global set of companies to work with the DOD so we can bring the best of the world to our war fighters. Um, and in some cases, we're just helping different um, startup communities connect with each other, um, whether that be you know, in different areas of the supply chain or value chain, whether that's connecting funders uh, to capabilities. Um, so I think this is an area that is very ripe uh, for more progress. I mean, I think one of the uh, most impressive things that this particular Secretary of Defense has done um, is in the context of Ukraine, when you think about the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, over 50 countries that our Secretary has assembled that have stayed together as a coalition for now over two years, um, providing support to Ukraine. Um, when one nation is you know, stymied with legislative processes, others are able to step in. And I think that allies and partners network has been so important to our power and our projection of that power. And that's something that, you know, DIU can deepen on the innovation ecosystem side. So at AFWorks, I try to complement what Karen's doing, right? She's looking out into the, um, the defense innovation ecosystem. Whereas we all know our government is big, we're not great at talking to each other, and it takes a, and there's also often a personal touch that's required to really convince people about things. And let's be real, innovation has some, especially in the DoD, has some black eyes. Like from, and people are, have had a, maybe a bad experience when things were a little bit less mature, or, um, you know, or they feel like it's innovation theater. Or maybe they're into it, but they only understand a pe one piece of the puzzle, and a lot is going on. It's a really dynamic community. So I work on basically trying to, within AFWORKS, trying to bring that AFWORKS message and the whole ecosystem message throughout the, um, the Department of Defense to help, under help people understand what we're, what we're achieving, actually bring those specific stories. Like just um, a few weeks ago, um, we had an Agile flag exercise, and we were supposed to just bring our autonomous aircraft to people to look at, it was cool, well guess what, like, they got there and they ended up tasking them. And we flew what we believe to be the longest autonomous flight, we're talking hundred, like over 100 miles, where the pilots did nothing, right? It took off, it, it taxied, it took off, and, and landed, delivered them in like cargo. So um, to be able to like, that sort of stuff is happening really fast. AFWERX does, we get 7,000 contract proposals a year and we award almost 2,000 a year. So being able to help people understand like all the amazing things that are happening as best as we can with that large volume um, so that the people who are making the really important decisions about financing, about uh, requirements and how the how the innovation ecosystem is going to thrive within the government means that we have to have senior leaders who understand what it is that we're doing and that we're not just you know wild west that can't be trusted right we I'm, we're, we have to build that trust within the government as well so that is a lot of you know how we have to look both between the services but also to look at all the folks who are not involved directly with the innovation ecosystem but will benefit from it if they can just understand how to harness its power. So there's a couple different ways that INSIN is connecting the ecosystem. 
Um, I like to think of us, like I said earlier, it's all about building the network through programming. So I like to think, you know, in all of the apocalypse movies, there's always that one guy licking off the grid who gave up years ago. I like to think that we know that guy. No matter who he is, and we have a relation, good enough relationship with him that we can pick up the phone call and he'll actually accept it and help us save the world. Um, that's really what we're about is building that network of those innovators through programming, um, both on the talent and the tech side. One of the new programs that we're doing that through, which I am over, is the Defense Innovation On-Ramp Hubs. So those are off-base um, collaboration centers. They have physical spaces. Um, we have programming associated with it. The whole point is kind of that safe, neutral space where industry, academia, and our defense partners can all work together on the hardest problem. So like I mentioned the programming, everything that Ensign does starts with a problem that was submitted by somebody else in the DOD. Um, we are not strictly focused on certain tech verticals. We are not strictly focused on shining after falling after shiny things, we're solving those problems real time. And it's really interesting to see once you start opening things up and starting partnering, I think my favorite is to work with the students um, because they have such a different perspective. And once you start getting that diversity of thought, they will think of how to solve those problems in ways that the quote experts would never think of. Um, a perfect example, uh, one of our capstone teams had worked with one of our, our mission partners. Um, they had submitted the problem, worked with them over the course of a semester. The, the prototype that those college students built ended up becoming a program of record. Saved that organization um, one to two years of R&D and one to two million dollars had they given that same um, statement of work to a prime. So, um, it's all about going faster and again, tapping into that new talent to help us do so. Thank you, Cassie. So I can tell you from sitting at Henscom Air Force Base, um, we've submitted five problem statements and instance picked up three, right? So they're actually taking those statements, partnering with academia, who then partners with the team who submitted it, because these are wicked problems, and by the way, we don't have the money. Um, but Ensign comes with that. We don't, you, we, we don't have to pay for it. So that government that's in the room, if you don't know who Ensign is or what Ensign is, um, they, they are, that's what they're about, is partnering with academia to get after those problems. So um, I can echo that. So we've talked a little bit about the how, and so um, this next question is really focused on the future, right? Um, the future, I think where we were, like I said, four years ago, isn't where we are today. And I think where we are today isn't gonna be we're gonna be sitting here next year and it's gonna be a completely different um, world yet again um, because I think it's evolving quickly and we need to keep pace. And so from each of your perspectives, um, with your current ecosystem, where do you see your future um, and how can that be influenced? So I, I really see the future. You know, there, there's an absolute wealth of opportunities in the DOD for every single company that's represented here at South by Southwest. The hard part for those companies is figuring out which of those opportunities is the right thing. Because you go to an AppWorks challenge or an Ensign challenge or a Propel accelerator or a local accelerator. Like, and that, re that requires a deep understanding of types and colors of funding from the government. Because, um, you know, in my prior life working directly for the Air Force Research Laboratory, like, I'd have companies coming to me all the time saying, I've solved your problem. Buy my product okay, I, I don't have the color of money to buy your product. I have the color of money to buy research. Do you need me to help you like develop your product more? No, I don't want to give you away my IP to you. I just want you to buy my product. Okay, well, I know my name says laboratory in it, and it seems like I should buy your really cool AI product, but I literally can't buy congressional mandate. And that's a really, really hard thing for companies to understand when they think that they found the right person to sell something to, and I should obviously want to buy their thing, even if I really, really want to buy their thing. Um, and so like the future as I see it is being able to distill a lot of that down. Like how can we take everything that's in our mind of how the government works and put some generative AI on it and be able to actually build a roadmap for the companies of like, all right, this is the type of thing I'm trying to do. Do I have research? Do I have not research? This is what the background of my company is. And actually build that roadmap and say, these are the best opportunities for you to gain. Um, you know, 
AFWORKS has a, has a great deal of power in the Cyber Center program. It's so cool that we have all of the Cyber Center funds unified in one organization. Um, the, the branding potential that we have in order to bring in new things to the government, that kind of thing. But what we can't do is set and customize work with the thousands of contracts that we have come in. We can't help them build that roadmap. And so if you're brand new to the government, like the phase ones are a great way to come into the government, but you need a little extra hand-holding. So what are the best accelerators in order to work with based on your background, your experience with the government, which areas of the government, stuff like that. Um, and be able to build that into the future and get quicker to where you need to go that has the type of money that you need in order to find that. That's where I really see the future going with this collaboration that we're working in. So I also see a big future for like pushing out educational materials. For us, the big focus is all of the new foreign ownership, control, and influence regulations that are coming down from Congress. So if you're a company and you're gonna go raise your seed round or your Series A, and you think you might wanna do business with the DOD, or you're a VC that's about to go raise a fund, there are some new things you guys need to know about the level of risk tolerance that the DOD is gonna be willing to accept with where money comes from, who are backers. That's not to say it's a non-starter. There's absolutely mitigation plans that can be put in place, but it's an area we're all learning together on the government side right now. So I think we owe you a lot of information on that so you guys can make smarter decisions as you're going to market commercially that'll help us work together better later on. I think for DIU, I would say a couple things. Number one, um, you know, we're really trying to operate at that sweet spot between understanding, as I said earlier, combatant command demand and services demand. If, if we can play in that Venn diagram in the middle of we know this is a real warfighter need and we know that our service partner will transition it at scale, that's where we want to be and that's where I think all of our partners want to be. And so we're trying to create connectivity on both of those ends so that we can bring those capabilities and then we can put that back out into the commercial tech sector when we know there are opportunities to scale. Um, you know, the other part of what DIU is trying to do is, um, and I apologize for those of you who heard me say this this morning, but we're really trying to go after culture change in the department. Um, this is really about um, changing many parts of our procurement acquisition process, but recognizing that it's hard to do wholesale change, and there are ways in which we can take small bites of the apple with every project that we do, identify a process that can be updated, that can be accelerated, and then challenge the department to codify that change and make it so every time going forward. Because to me, the future needs to be, the adversary needs to understand that the department can move quickly. Like what I want the PRC to be thinking is that the department can move within two year cycles, that we can procure with agility, that we can get the cutting edge technology, that we can pivot quickly when that's needed, and that all of the processes along the way, not just in tech scouting and identity, development, procurement, uh, ATO, experimentation, that all of those pieces can follow. And I think that will require culture change. I think it will require a different level of risk tolerance in some cases. It will require a partnership with Congress because we'll be proceeding in ways that we haven't before. We'll be moving sequentially, excuse me, we'll be moving in parallel where previously we were moving sequentially and part of that is inherently then taking some risk and and accepting that in some cases we'll be wrong, that maybe we you know, did a couple of things at the same time and we decided the capability wasn't right and we go back. Um, and so that is, I think, um, the future and that is what DIU is trying to do, you know, one project, one initiative at a time. So with part of, part of one of the challenges we have in the innovation ecosystem is tying a prototype and actually getting it tied to a program of record so that it can survive, right? Uh, we can have the best things. One of the saddest things I ever witness is when we get, uh, we show an operator something amazing and then we have to take it away from them because we can't figure out the bureaucracy. I don't want that anymore. So how does this affect companies, right? Of course we want companies to survive, but they've got this great product. We want them producing that product. And so being able to more closely um, take our processes within the ecosystem and make sure that those feed the programs of record and the financial system so that we can jump over that valley of death 
so that we can make sure that these prototypes turn into, into solutions that are then scaled and fielded and sustained. Um, there are a lot of parts that have to be done within the government so that we can better partner with industry, and that's working within our financial system, it's working within our, our uh, program system, and it's also working with, um, working with Congress, right? Um, as long as they're gonna have a, be holding us to a financial system where I have to prop, tell them how I'm going to spend every penny for the next five years, and there's no room for innovation or adapting to what is in front of us today, um, it's hard to survive. And so I am, my, I am hopeful uh, for the future in trying to better link how we are working as an innovation ecosystem with our program executive officers so that um, in the short term we work better within the system as it exists today and then maybe based on things coming out and, uh, maybe we can have a better system in the future and we're all we're ready to be that challenge. What I'm seeing for the future is I think that we're going to start seeing a lot more connected tissues. Um, everyone is building their own network and recognizing the importance of that. Several organizations across the DOD and across the government are opening innovation hubs similar to the Defense Innovation on-ramp hubs. The more we start connecting those together, just like the DICE, I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of that and creating those two connective tissues across at all levels. Um, the more connected tissue that we have between our different organizations, um, with our local communities, the faster we can move through those, through that network because there's more nodes, there's more pathways to get to where we need to be. Just like Karen and Casey said earlier, I may not be the right person, but I know who is, or I know the program that's right for you. The more connections that we have like that, the faster we can help um, innovators navigate through through our through our systems and some of those barriers really come with Aditi's point about the culture it's sometimes it's not even about the entire culture needs to change it's that we're dealing with so many different cultures you almost need a translator um, the cultures within each of the services within each of their innovation organizations within the services then you start looking outside of the fence line with our industry and our academia partners and then we really start getting wild when we start reaching out to the industries um, that maybe never had an idea that maybe that they should be working with the Department of Defense. I work a lot with the video game developers down in Orlando. Um, they speak a very different language and have a very different culture. So being able to be a translator to then make those connections, I really see that's where the future is going to help us accelerate change. That was great. And I'd like to add one part to that. So as we talk about the culture, realize too that hiring Hiring is a challenge for all of us. And so um, as we hire, that means new. And new usually doesn't equal risk taking, by the way. It's actually very conservative, especially in the acquisition world. And so you can see there's a lot of momentum to stay with what is known, and then you just learn in the safe route. But don't hesitate to teach that acquisition professional contracting. You've seen it, share it with them. Just, hey, I'm not telling you what to do, but this could work, right? Don't hold it back and then hang up the phone and be like, oh, I'm so done with them. Have a little patience, bring them along because they're new as well. And, and if we don't get them over the line, they're gonna stay there. And that's not gonna help any of us, right? So um, before we go to questions, because I think we're starting to get a little bit short, so we'll do a, a rapid round really quick. So, um, and we'll start with you, Cassie. How do you access your, your new microsystem? We brought up microsystems, uh, micro ecosystems when we were talking online and preparing for this. And so if we could start with you and work our way this way um, for the audience. Yeah, so how INSA really does that is embedding ourselves within within the local community. So we have a, a regional engagement model where we have people who are part of the local communities throughout the entire country. So they're the ones, they have been there a long time, they have those trusted relationships, they know to pick up the phone and call Karen or Casey, they know who on the academia side who to call and really can um, broker a lot of those relationships. And it's once it's those kind of key players in there that are really helping to connect those different micro ecosystems and make people feel that um, they're wanted and that they're a part of it because they have kind of a uh, trusted guide to bring them through that front door to defense innovation. Uh, 
first of all, what Cassie said. So I think Ensign is a, a key part of DIU writ large's overall regional strategy where we're taking advantage of the pockets of innovation and entrepreneurship that exist all over this country. And we're better off as a nation if we do that. Um, and so we have folks spread out all over um, the country, experts that um, are connecting with entrepreneurs, with universities, et cetera. Um, and then the uh, other way we're doing that is within the department, DIU is really focused on embedding our folks uh, in both the sources of demand and supply. So we are embedding folks with the combatant commands so we can really understand and be there with, the, um, with their acquisition community and their operators to really um, um, drive our priorities and then embedding um, with services and service innovation organizations on the other hand to, to really drive the transition partners. Um, that is a big part of our strategy and I think it will um, create those networks that um, I think we need to be in that Venn diagram that I described. All right, for us it's twofold. We've got a network of chambers of commerce, aggregators, accelerators, venture capitalists who will push out opportunities or hey, they're thinking about this thing. Anybody have something that they want to share? And we can target that geographically. So if we're going to do an Industry 4.0 solicitation, we should definitely be hitting up Pittsburgh and Detroit. If we're doing MedSim, we should be going to St. Paul, Minnesota, right? The other thing is we heavily leverage social media. So follow us on LinkedIn. We've got a website, and that helps cover the gaps, right, of where we might not have the best coverage network-wise. We can still find those companies. They can still get the information. Just, you know, through social media and not personal connection. I noticed that Jen slightly slid the microphone right by. I'm not going to let that stand. <laughs> so, because I think for Alphorx perspective, Spark, the division that she's going to be taking over and leading here in a month as um, Riddler heads into retirement, is um, absolutely one of the best connections. It, it is the heart of Afworx. It is our, all about our airmen. It's all of our airmen-based programs where we get airmen to the sites of innovation, but it's also where all of our spark cells are. Um, we've got well over 100 spark cells uh, throughout domestically and internationally, and those are our airmen at the base embedded in the ecosystem looking for the cool stuff. And I think that's one of the easiest ways to engage with Afworx and start to learn what it is the Air Force perspective of the universe learn about our programming and learn about those opportunities. So. Uh, I think, <laughs> I know I tried to slide by, but I, uh, Cassie was really good and I had a hard time coming. <laughs> she covered everything I was gonna cover, but Karen, uh, you reminded me as well, is that um, I think also certain things that we're doing within Prime are really interesting for the different micro ecosystems, if you will. So for instance, with autonomy, we have the autonomy proving ground. And so there are a lot of test ranges where the range master is not willing to let us do auto, uh, autonomous testing because it's not something they're familiar with. There's a lot going on where things are already built on trust and reputation. And because we're starting from scratch, like how do we do that, right? How do we, get, how do we build that trust? Well, we basically had to target one and say, okay, here's all the stuff we built, which they described in one of the earlier panels. Um, with the safety envelope and stuff so that we can start getting our uh, reps in so that we can build that trust. Um, similarly with Agility Prime, um, the, the, the FAA, they're, they're still thinking through like how we deal with regulation with, um, with uncrewed aircraft or with autonomous vehicles. And that's, you know, if we just wait for the FAA to figure it out, we may not like the outcome, and it is probably not as fast as we need. So instead, we're partnering with them um, to make sure that we help um, write that regulation. Not we're not writing the regulation together, but we're providing them lots of data. We're providing them opportunities to see things in action and to to make their decisions and their policies based on what they're actually seeing versus where their imagination goes. And so I think building those connections as well to build trust with these regulatory agencies. Um, be it internal to the military or outside, really are part of um, how we get after um, connecting certain groups that all have a common goal, but we have some like some of those steps we have to take, such as testing, that are really hard, and they're, we're not currently positioned for those. And so, what we want to do is make sure that we're working with all the people who um, could be barriers instead of making them partners in crime. Okay, so we have ten minutes left. So, questions. Thank you.
Thank you. Two parts. First is, typically innovation takes a champion and the end user at a beginning level. That rotation happens once or twice. And the next time by the third person's there, they don't even know what it's about. For instance, PACAC paid with the ACE and MCA for attack fi Two rotations happened and Colonel Osborne didn't even know that he paid for it or had the product. So how do we avoid that? And then second of all, when you do have an innovation and it really is revolutionary, the TPOX do not know how to then push that through to the rest of the organization. Who do they talk to and what's set up to help them out? I'll start from the Army side. The bureaucracy sucks, all right? One of the things the Army is admittedly not good at is how when you find that thing that can change warfare, but you didn't plan on finding it, how do you get it in the budget in under two years? And the answer is we still don't know. There are things that AFC is exploring, like directed requirements. So General Rainey, our four star, is one of three people in the Army that can sign a requirements document. Now that doesn't guarantee funding, but it does short circuit the requirement cycle by about a year and a half to help get money into the budget sooner, right? And one of the things we're all exploring together as a DICE community is how do we get a little bit more flexibility in our funding, either rdt and &E that can wiggle between a couple of different colors, or could we use Alma for something versus rdt and &E to try to help give commanders the flexibility to capitalize on that. So it's not a quick solution, but it's a way of saying we're all trying to figure out how to be that problem because you're not the only one that sees it. So I'm going to try to answer your question a little tactically too. So, because um, I imagine as companies you're wanting to understand like how do I actually deal with this today? So we're a learning organization. AFWorks only started up five years ago. And um, like most startups, things are a little scrappy at the beginning and we kind of figure stuff out and then we get better. And so things that we have done to try to, we, we've heard the problems that you've described. Um, a couple of things that we've done to work on that. Number one is about the, the, the champion or the, the um, partner organization not knowing what's going on, is now for those uh, larger packages, the paperwork actually has to be submitted by the government organization instead of the company. So um, that is one way we're using to make sure that the program executive officers are understanding like what's being gone for a strat by specifically. Um, also, with the strap pies, this year we did something new, and because our the way that we analyzed strap pies uh, was a little less organized, and so now what we do is when the strap pie competitions are happening, once the actual uh, we get down to the down select list, it is approved by a new board of directors, which includes the senior acquisition executives from both the Air Force and the Space Force, and they're sitting in the meeting together. So any of the things that are approved at this level now have the seal of approval from the SAE, which also means it's got a little bit of top cover to say, get this stuff done. As And then we're hoping that between those two process improvements that we experimented with this year, that that will help build awareness. Now going to the TPOC, the technical point of contact challenge. Um, this is not something that the Air Force is like, or the Space Force is, is, we don't have like a billet that says this guy, this person is the TPOC. It's usually taken out of hide. And so what that means is that our partner organization who's providing the technical point of contact, they, um, maybe they don't understand what the TPOC needs to be. Maybe they don't understand how much, how important that person is or what the right level of subject matter expertise is. And we understand that. And again, we're working on such volume. This is where it's really, I'll admit it's hard. It's hard to get it right every time. We're doing 2,000 contracts a year. But we're working on improving our communications with the partner organizations. Uh, we are working on our TPOC training. And then um, we're, we've actually corrected a few things where like if TPOCs weren't being responsive, we do go try to engage more actively with those units to try to, um, get that on board so that the, the TPOC is providing the information that's needed for the companies. Question? I think we have time for one more. Yeah, how do we um, 
ensure or can we ensure that we stay ahead of our adversary peers uh, in regards to connecting the ecosystem when we have vastly different philosophies on that. So we value uh, partnering and building a relationship with our industry partners. We care about them being profitable. Uh, we want them to succeed as we do. We care about intellectual property and protecting it. Uh, and you also mentioned a number of times the bureaucracy that we deal with. And uh, that varies significantly from all of our adversarial peers. So how do we stay ahead or can we ensure that we are able to I'm sure everybody has opinions on this. Um, number one, I think most of the things you listed are our strengths. Um, I think that uh, our community of uh, innovators is going to stay ahead because of precisely some of the attributes that you listed. Um, I think a great source of our strength, as I mentioned earlier, is our ally and partner network as well. I mean, that is something that our adversary doesn't have or it doesn't have uh, as extensive of a network that we do. And so how can we leverage um, the power of um, innovators around the globe, um, venture capitalists, private equity firms to drive investment into this. So, so that is why um, the global uh, partnerships piece is, is uh, such a pillar of, of DIU's um, uh, strategy. Um, and then I think it's all of the things that you're hearing today, right? Like we are trying to build the connections across the services, across the combatant commands, across OSD, um, to um, better understand the technology areas that will be important to that advantage and all put our collective efforts and funding and authorities towards that. Um, and so being really clear about what the demands are, projecting that demand signal to industry, working with Congress to make sure that we can keep that demand signal steady over time, reforming our acquisition processes to move faster, um, implementing other process changes and the cultural change that I talked about to be able to move quickly across all points, all the way to delivery to the warfighter. I think those are the things that will uh, keep our edge. All of this. Okay, so this is the time we have. Um, I, if you walk away with today uh, that you learned something new, what we stand for and the how, how to interact with, um, and really the integration amongst everybody um, I had no idea. I had no idea we had come this far, and I consider myself nosy. Um, but th that's a testament to how fast we are moving. I can tell you that um, leadership is absolutely pushing it down, and we know we need to accelerate, and you're part of that change. We need to change, we need to accelerate, and we need you to partner to do that to be successful. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the Capital Factory. Thank you, all of you, for a great panel.